Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today we look at church etiquette, and we begin with an excerpt from a book entitled Church Life. The chapter is entitled Orthodox Church Life. Church etiquette. The church is the earthly heaven in which the heavenly God dwells and moves. An Orthodox Church is that part of God's creation which has been set apart and reclaimed for the Kingdom of God. Within its walls, the heavenly and earthly realms meet, outside time, in the acts of worship and sacrifice offered there to God. Angels assist the priests during the Divine Liturgy, and saints and members of the Church triumphant participate in the services. The Blessed Theotokos, the Mother of God, is also present and, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ is invisibly present wherever two or three gather in His name, just as He is always present in the reserved Eucharist preserved on the holy table of most Orthodox churches. Given these very significant spiritual realities, we should always approach an Orthodox church with the deepest attitude of reverence. Even when passing an Orthodox Church on foot or in a car, we always cross ourselves out of respect for the presence of God therein. It is, indeed, unthinkable that we should ever pass in front of an Orthodox Church without showing such reverence. Therefore, it is obvious that we must approach our meeting with the heavenly realm during divine services with careful and proper preparation. When preparing for church, we should always dress as we would for a visit to an important dignitary. After all, we are about to enter into the very presence of God. Therefore, casual apparel is not appropriate. For example, shorts should never be worn in an Orthodox church by either sex, under any circumstances. Men should normally wear a suit and tie. Women should wear dresses or skirts and should always cover their heads. The style and color of clothes worn by Orthodox Christians should be subdued and modest, especially when attending church. Men's shirts should be buttoned to the neck. Tight clothing, sleeveless tops, and garnish, garish t-shirts should be avoided, since they are wholly inappropriate for Christians. In fact, the rule of thumb for proper dress, both in and out of church building, is this. Avoid wearing anything which would draw attention to oneself. This includes jewelry, makeup, the ostentatious use of perfume or cologne for men, and large or gaudy hats. When we enter a church, we should always strive to develop an attitude like that of the humble publican. Thus, anything in our appearance which would conflict with an attitude of humble piety should be considered inappropriate. When arriving at the church for services, we should seek to arrive a few minutes before the service begins in order to prepare ourselves and clear our minds. In some churches, and especially in old believer communities, one removes his shoes before entering the church. This is, of course, impractical in larger churches, and thus, unfortunately, the custom, one still followed by Muslims and inherited from their Christian ancestors, has almost died out in Orthodox community countries. But the symbolic meaning of removing our shoes in an attempt to keep the dirt of the world from the church reminds us that, even more importantly, we must not carry the worldly dirt of our minds into the divine services. On entering the church proper, having crossed ourselves when approaching the building, we normally reverence the central icon in the narthex with three prostrations. This is done by making the sign of the cross twice with a bow, bending and touching the ground with the right hand, or if one wishes, a prostration, falling to the knees and bending the head almost to the ground. With regard to prostrations, it should be remembered here that because Sunday is the day of resurrection, we do not make prostrations or kneel in church after Saturday Vespers. This prostration holds not only for Sundays, 
but also for the entire festal period from Pascha to Pentecost. In some monasteries, this rule is applied to the whole of Saturday as well. We then kiss the icon, preferably on the saint's right hand, if the saint is blessing or holding a cross, and cross ourselves a third time, making a final bow or prostration. Because we should not smudge or otherwise deface an icon, women should avoid wearing lipstick to church, if not altogether. We might point out that St. John of Shanghai and San Francisco even issued an ukase concerning the inadmissibility of venerating icons when wearing lipstick. Orthodox churches always have candles available at the back of the church. One should normally light one of these before an icon as he enters the church. If you have a special need or wish to remember someone prayerfully, you can make this known to God by lighting a candle as a pious offering to God. St. John of Kronstadt tells us, The candles burning on the altar represent the non-created light of the Trinity, for the Lord dwells in an unapproachable light. They also represent the fire of divinity which destroys our ungodliness and sins. The candles lit before the icons of the Savior signify that he is the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. At the same time, he is a fire which engulfs and revives our souls and bodies. The candles lit before the icons of the Theotokos are, symbol, are a symbol of the fact that she is the mother of the unapproachable light, and also of her most pure and burning love for God and her love for mankind. The candles lit before icons of saints reflect their ardent love for God, for whose sake they gave up everything that man prizes in life, including their very lives, as did the holy apostles, martyrs, and others. These candles also mean that these saints are lamps burning for us and providing light for us by their own saintly living, their virtues and their ardent intercession for us before God through their constant prayers day and night. The burning candles also stand for our ardent zeal and the sincere sacrifice we make out of reverence and gratitude to them for their solicitude on our behalf before God. After having reverenced the icon in the center of the church and having lit a candle, we then assume our places in the church, men on the right, women on the left, as we face the altar. The habit of kissing the icons on the templon, the altar screen in front of the church, often improperly called the iconostation, which can be seen in the most traditional of churches and monasteries, is not technically correct. These icons should actually be reverenced by the bishop or the serving clergy, not the faithful or others in attendance at the services. A traditional church will have no pews, but only several benches or choir stalls, stasidia in Greek, around the periphery of the church, for the infirm or aged. Therefore, the faithful stand through most of the services. It is impious, arrogant, and improper to sit before God during divine services. Pews and sitting during services are a Protestant innovation. The natural consequences of services that entail not a meeting of the heavenly with the earthly, but the recitation of a sermon uh, accompanying, accompanied by hymns. The separation of worship from a sense of participation in the mysteries of God and its reduction to viewing and listening to a performance by a preacher and choir is incompatible with the orthodox understanding of worship. So is sitting during services. With regard to pews and standing during prayer, we should note that the modernist or reform, reformed new calendarist Orthodox churches did not start using pews until late in this century, and then primarily in the West. The ancient worship of the Christian church has always involved standing, even Western cathedrals like Notre Dame in Paris and Il Duomo in Florence never had pews. 
It was unthinkable to the fathers of the church that one should sit in the presence of the King of Glory, as well Orthodox worship is active. The faithful are called upon to be participants in the liturgy and not to be mere spectators. First, this requires attention, and that attention is most complete in the standing position. This ancient practice has been validated by a researcher at the University of Southern California who has determined that people literally think faster on their feet and process information up to 20% faster when standing. Second, proper participation in the liturgy involves bowing, the making of the sign of the cross, and sometimes prostrations. These active forms of worship are lost in churches which have pews. As we stand attentively, our hands should be at our sides. It is improper and disrespectful for anyone to put his hands behind his back, which signals an arrogant stand of defiance, or in his pockets, which is a sign of casual relaxation, hardly something appropriate for worship. We worship God with our whole bodies, and thus even our posture should show reverence and humility. We must never lean against the walls of the church, which are sacred and which are often covered with icons, and we should not stand in an inattentive way. Since soldiers can stand at attention for long periods of time, since children can stand in a line for several hours to see a movie, and since cheerleaders at sports events can assume a certain pose for extended lengths of time, anyone who says that proper posture and standing in church are impossible is simply being irrational. While standing in worship, the sign of the cross should normally be made at the end of each petition chanted by the deacon or priest accompanied by a slight bow. In some monasteries where silence is assiduously maintained, this practice does not hold since movement can be distracting. We make the sign of the cross one when the name of God, Christ, or the Trinity is mentioned. Two, when the Theotokos or any saint's name is mentioned. Three, when we say the Trisigian, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy in us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. The Lord's Prayer, Our Father, and other similar prayers. 4. At the end of each petition in a litany, as we noted above. 5. Whenever the deacon or priest says, Let us beseech the Lord. 6. Whenever the curtain to the altar is opened or closed. 7. At any time that you wish to pray for or remember any person during the course of the service. For instance, when the deacon or priest commemorates the bishop or the sick or those traveling. There are also circumstances when we do not normally make the sign of the cross. Two such instances are. 1. When a priest or bishop blesses with his hand. We should, properly, simply bow slightly in acknowledgement of this blessing. This is also true when one approaches a priest or bishop for a blessing. He should not cross himself, but receive the blessing of the clergyman in question. 2. During the reading of the six psalms during matins. There are also times during the services, as we have noted, when the faithful make a bow bowing slightly or touching the ground with the right hand, or a prostration, metanoa in Greek, or poklon in Russian, crossing ourselves, falling to the knees, and bending the head down to the ground, we bow one. When we venerate an icon, especially on Saturday or Sunday, when we are not to make prostrations. Two. At the beginning of any service and each time that the reader says, O oh, come, let us worship. 3. At several specific times during the liturgy. 4. When the deacon, priest, or bishop senses in our direction. 5. When the priest or bishop makes an entrance into the altar during vespers or liturgy. 6. During the bishop, towards the bishop, if present in the church, 
when he is commemorated during the petitions. We make prostrations, one, as described above when entering the church and venerating the central icon. As long as we are outside Paschal Tide and it is not Sunday. Some people only bow in this instance. This too is proper. Two, when anyone enters the altar outside Paschal Tide and on days other than Sunday, even if he is only going in to clean. After prostrating or bowing, a bishop, priest, or deacon kisses the holy table. No one else should, incidentally, ever touch the holy table under any circumstances. 3. At certain points in the Divine Liturgy during the week outside Paschal Tide. At the end of any service, the priest will come out facing us and commemorate a list of various saints. We should cross ourselves at each name mentioned. This may seem artificial and repetitive at first, but if we work through our initial resistance, this corporate action of the believers with the priest facing one another is really quite beautiful and very beneficial for the community. Of course, this is only possible if we strive to maintain an attitude of humble reverence. All of these acts of piety and attempts to participate in the services are empty and vain if they are done with the slightest hint of pride or showiness. This is easily avoided when we focus all of our attention on the altar and the prayers, participating in the service from a sense of awe and gratitude for God's infinite mercy. This attitude will not come easily or quickly. There will be days when we simply have other things on our mind. What we must remember is that nothing which seems important in our daily lives and which distracts us from worship will be of any consequence 50 or 100 years from now. Our prayers, on the other hand, are heard eternally. We properly begin the weekend cycle of divine services with attendance at Vespers, or the Vespers Matins Vigil, on Saturday afternoon or evening, or on the afternoon or evening before a feast day. In order to understand what feast or saint is being commemorated at the liturgy, it is necessary to attend the Vespers service and hear the hymnody, which both praises and often describes the meaning of the feast or the life of the saint. Since, over the church year, all of the great doctrines of the fathers about Christ and the saints can be found in this hymnody, the Vespers and Matin services are indispensable to a correct knowledge of our faith. To miss the Vespers service as a matter of convenience is to deny ourselves the opportunity of learning the basic tenets of our faith. Moreover, the Vesper service prayerfully prepares us for the coming of Christ into our midst during the Divine Liturgy. Our lives are often so hectic and crammed with activity during the week that it becomes necessary to slow down and contemplate our relationship to our Creator with services of preparation for the Liturgy. Be still and know that I am God. The Lord tells us through the prophet King David, this is almost impossible to achieve if our only contact with the church is on Sunday morning. The second service in the cycle of Orthodox worship is Matins, which is celebrated Sunday morning before the Divine Liturgy. In the Slavic churches, Vespers and Matins are often combined into one service called the All-Night Vigil. If we are attending a vigil, the end of Vespers is immediately followed by the six psalms. These six psalms constitute the most solemn set of prayers read in any service, for they are believed to be the prayers that will be heard at the beginning of the dread judgment, when Christ appears at the end of the world. For this reason, we stand perfectly still, in absolute concentration, as we will when confronted by His judgment at the end of time. If matins is performed separately, then some opening prayers and psalms and a short litany are read before beginning the six psalms. During these readings, as we noted above, we do not cross ourselves, but remain absolutely still. 
While the Matins Gospel is being read, we look humbly to the ground and listen attentively. Afterwards, the priest will bring out the Holy Gospel, an ornate book containing the Gospel readings for the church year, for us to venerate. We first venerate the icon in the center of the church as we did when we entered. We then proceed to the priest and make two bows, reverently kissing the gospel and not, according to Greek custom, the hand of the priest, who holds the gospel in his hands, both hands being covered by the end of his philonion. And then make a third bow. We venerate the gospel as we would an icon of Christ. St. John of Damascus made it quite clear that the written word is a form of icon. St. John of Damascus says, The sixth kind of image, icon, is made for the remembrance of past events, such as miracles or good deeds, in order that glory, honor, and eternal memory may be given to those who have struggled valiantly. They assist the increase of virtue that evil men might be put to shame and overthrown, and they benefit generations to come, that by gazing upon such images we may be encouraged to flee evil and desire good. These images are of two kinds. Either they are words written in books, in which case the written word is the image, or else they are material images, such as the jar of manna or Aaron's staff. Since the Gospel contains the very words of Christ, it is also considered the most sacred of images. After having attended Vespers and Matins, we attend the Divine Liturgy. We should fast from midnight the night before this service, in order to be attentive during the celebration and in order to prepare ourselves for receiving Holy Communion or into Doran. The Blessed Bread which is distributed at the end of the Liturgy. If the Divine Liturgy is being held at midnight, then we would fast six to eight hours prior to the start of the liturgy. This is a strict fast which excludes all foods and liquids. Even if we do not commune during the liturgy, the Antidoran at the end affords us a kind of participation in the Eucharist. This is because it has been in the very presence of the Holy Mysteries, remaining bread and not becoming the body of Christ, but taking on the blessing of the Eucharist. For this blessing we, again, prepare ourselves by fasting. If we are communing, then we should, as a minimum, have kept the Wednesday and Friday fast. We should also fast from meat on Saturday. But since Saturday is not a day of fasting, except for Great and Holy Saturday, we should eat olive oil and drink wine and, if our spiritual father allows it, eggs and dairy products at midday. From midday on Saturday, we should normally fast as on any Wednesday or Friday. Married couples should, of course, fast from the flesh before communing. During a regular fasting period, such as Great Lent, the preparation for communion is already accomplished. For this reason, priests usually counsel their people to commune more frequently during an appointed fast. Before coming to church, we should also say our communion prayers in the icon corner of our home. These prayers prepare us mentally and spiritually for partaking of the Divine Eucharist. We must also confess our sins to the priest before communing in order to make our preparation complete. St. Paul was very clear about the grave necessity of this preparation. Whenever whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Having made the necessary preparations, we should go to the church for the Divine Liturgy a bit early. Thus we give ourselves time to venerate the icons, light a candle, 
and present the names of those living or dead Orthodox Christians whom we wish to have commemorated by the priest during the service of preparation. In the Slavic churches, small loaves of pros, prosphoron bread are available to accompany the list. In both Greek and Slavic churches, the faithful usually have a commemoration book which contains a listing of both the living and the dead Orthodox Christians whom they wish to have commemorated at the service. Usually, an altar server will carry these back to the priest while he is doing the service of preparation. It should be noted that only Orthodox Christians are commemorated in the liturgy, since it is the common worship of all those joined together in right belief. The heterodox, for whom we can and must pray, should be remembered only in our private prayers and never by name in the public worship of the Church. This includes political leaders too. The Divine Liturgy has prayers for all people, but those whom we mention by name are those who belong to the fullness of Orthodoxy, who share our baptism and our beliefs, and who are loyal to Orthodox teachings. Even an Orthodox patriarch, who is not of right belief, who has fallen to wrong doctrine, cannot be mentioned by name in the liturgy. Thus, the more zealous fathers on Mount Athos will not even utter the name of the Patriarch of Constantinople, a modernist and ecumenist, who has compromised the faith, though the See of Constantinople has always been the protector of the Athenite communities. During the service of preparation, the hours are usually read. These are short services of psalms and prayers, which the early Christians read throughout the day as part of their effort to pray unceasingly. This time is sometimes used for the hearing of confessions, especially if more than one priest is present, though this practice is not a good one and detracts from the services. After the matin services, or the reading of the hours, the Divine Liturgy begins. During the most solemn parts of this service, we are called upon to participate in the following ways. 1. At the time of the Great Entrance, we should bow slightly as the gifts are brought out from the altar. We should never bow down so far during liturgical entrances that we do not see what is happening. Entrances and prostrations in the church call our attention to something, the gospel, the offerings for the Eucharist, an icon, and we should not be looking at the floor when they take place. Otherwise, they lose their meaning. When the priest passes, we may gently touch or kiss the edge of his philonion. We should stand upright just before the priest enters the beautiful gates. When the priest says, take eat. We should make a bow and then stand upright. The modern practice of kneeling at this point is rooted in the incorrect idea that these words constitute the consecration of the Eucharistic elements. The Orthodox Church has never held to that understanding. 3. When the priest says, take drink, we once again make a slight bow and then stand upright. When the priest says, Thine own of thine own, we bow or make a prostration on days when this is permitted, and remain bowed down or prostrate until the priest says, especially for our most holy. It is during this time that the priest reads the prayers of consecration inside the altar. 5. After the Our Father, when the priest exclaims, Holy things are for the holy, we bow, or make a prostration on days when this is permitted, and then remain bowed down or prostrate until the choir finishes. One is holy. 6. When the deacon or priest presents the chalice and chants with fear of God, we either bow or make a quick prostration, when allowed, and then stand upright again. If we are to commune, we go to the central icon in the church and venerate it as we did when we entered the church. We then move to form a line to the right of the ambon. Our arms are crossed over our chest with the right arm over the left. 
As we go forward, we should humbly allow men to commune first, in order of rank within the church and by age, eldest first. Then the women should commune by rank, usually the priest's wife or presbytera first, and by age. Finally, the children should come forward, boys first, by age. We do this in keeping with St. Paul's admonition that all things be done decently and in order. We must always approach the mysteries with the greatest reverence. Thus, if someone should push ahead, allow him to do so. It serves no purpose for us to start an argument and to distract the other faithful as they receive the mysteries. When we receive the mysteries, we should still have our arms folded on our chest, making sure that the communion cloth is held carefully under our chin. We should open our mouth well enough in advance for the priest to place the spoon in it easily. We should close our lips on the spoon as the priest communes us, and then allow him to draw the spoon out with our lips closed, thus wiping the spoon clean. We should not attempt to kiss the chalice, despite the fact that this is a common practice in the Slavic churches, but quietly withdraw from the cloth and move over to take some antidoran, dipping a piece lightly in the wine provided. The most critical concern for us when we commune is to make certain that we do nothing that might accidentally tip or knock the chalice from the priest's hand. As we take, as we partake of the antidoran, we should be very careful not to let any crumbs drop on the floor. If we did not commune, but have fasted from midnight, then at the end of the service we should come forward after venerating the center icon and approach the priest, cupping our hands right hand over left as the priest places the antidoron in our hands, we should kiss his hand. It is a pious custom to take some of the antidoron home to consume during the week. A resealable plastic bag should be brought to church to keep the antidoron for the journey home. Those who have communed and who have taken the antidoran that should be provided immediately after Holy Communion should not take antidoran again at the end of the Divine Liturgy. After the final blessing, the communion prayers of thanksgiving are read quietly by the reader. During this time, we should all contemplate the mysteries of God and His mercy, as the prayers exhort us to do. After these prayers are finished, we should venerate the icons as we did when we came into the church and quietly leave in the same order that we communed. We should refrain from greeting friends and acquaintances until after we have left the porch of the church. The deacon or priest is probably still consuming the mysteries which remained and is cleaning the chalice. Our Lord is still present in the altar. An atmosphere of quiet reverence, therefore, should always be maintained in the direct vicinity of the church. Keep in mind that these guidelines for church attendance are structured for the communities within our own jurisdiction. There will be some variation in practice in Slavic churches since our emphasis is on Greek practice. But these differences will be very minor. In modernist churches, which have lost many of the traditions of the Orthodox Church, perhaps only some of these traditions are followed. In any case, if you find any deviation from them in your community, always manifest an attitude of humility towards what you see. We have not cited these traditions for the purpose of creating tension and hostility. Our purpose is to educate and instruct, not to condemn or judge. Concentrate on doing those things which you can do, in a spirit of reverence and gentleness, and avoid criticizing others. Such a witness over a period of time could very well inspire those around you to seek a more traditional life as well. The following are nine points of etiquette for children in an Orthodox Church. 1. Sit on the carpet, sit in a chair, or sit quietly, perhaps at an adult's feet, on the carpet. Do not lie on the carpet at any time, except for babies. Sleepy children can be held in the arms of a parent until they fall asleep. When they are asleep, they can be placed on the floor, preferably facing the altar. 2. Toes toward the altar. 
teach the children to keep his or her toes pointed toward the altar at all times. Always face the altar, never turn your back on it, even when facing the procession during the great entrance. Turn back counterclockwise rather than turn directly toward the back. No large muscle motions. A child standing and facing the altar should not be waving arms, swiveling, etc. 3. Stay in one place. A child should stake out an area and stick to it, and not move around the church. Exception. There is an age during which wiggling babies demand to be put on the floor, and once there, take off crawling rapidly. You pick them up, and the cycle immediately begins again. This phase doesn't last too long, so we should be patient with these little explorers. If a baby crawls by you, pick him up, maybe even hold him and help him focus on the service before returning him to his parents. 4. Help each other out. In general, adults not caring for their own children should help our swamped young parents watch over their kids. In many cases, these parents are outnumbered by their kids. If you feel drawn to a particular child, ask her parents if he can, if you can help them mind her during church. 5. Noise, noise, noise. Each parent needs to determine at what point their child has become too noisy. Occasional noise is fine, but continual noise can be very distracting. Some parents have found that taking the child out for making noise results in more noise because the child wants a change of scenery or wants to play with toys. Some children also view this time alone with mom as a victory. If any of these scenarios become a problem, the child could be taken out by dad or an adult helper. 6. Refrain from playing and talking. Children should not play with each other or talk to each other. Adults bending down to explain the service to children is fine and may help them not be bored. The bookstore has a couple of good child-level guides to the church and the liturgy. Aim to convey to your children that church is a place you want to be because you find love and joy there, and you want them to share in these good things. 7. No food in church, though bottles and sippy cups are okay when necessary for babies and toddlers. At some point, children need to begin fasting before communion like adults do. 8. Toys should be kept to an absolute minimum. A necessary favorite teddy bear is one thing. Dressing up Barbies is another. If toys are brought into the service, they should be selected for their quiet qualities. They don't make noise when dropped, and they don't encourage the child to supply noises for them. Especially beware of provoking resentment in children whose parents don't allow them to play in church, or undermining their discipline. So-and-so does it, why can't I? 9. Think of those around you. Remember that behavior that doesn't seem distracting, distracting to you could be distracting to the people behind you, particularly the choir, which has a bird's-eye view of everything anyone does. The key to success in all this is practice at home. Have an evening prayer time at your icon corner where children learn to stand and be quiet and reverent. Explain that your home icon corner is like a branch from the main altar at church and that the altar deserves even more respect. There are relics embedded in the wooden cross under our altar and it has been consecrated by our bishop who told us that an angel stands there constantly in worship. Adults as well as children need to treat the church and especially the altar area with great respect. Children will object to these expectations, but they learn to do many things they don't want to because their parents insist on them. Brushing teeth, having a regular bedtime, not eating cookies before dinner, when parents have a firm reverence for the church and insist on these standards, children will meet them. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us.